Well, welcome everybody to another of our Hydroterra webinar series. We've had quite a lot of webinars now and uh, continuing to grow in popularity. So thanks very much for attending today. Today, the topic is wastewater management, uh, monitoring and reporting insights. And we're very fortunate to have Matt Shanahan, who's a principal with RMCG, who are a consultancy that do a huge amount of work in this area and who we've uh, collaborated with extensively over the years on various projects in this area. Matt's involved quite a bit with uh, the new regulations that are coming out and uh, he's gonna to refer to that as well in his presentation, as well as the impact of the new EPA Act. Um, we're also gonna talk a bit about some case studies. So there's a picture of Matt. Uh, Matt's background, uh, he's based in Bendigo and he is a principal in this area. He's got over 20 years experience working predominantly in the area of recycled water, but also particularly around sort of agricultural applications of that and also dealing with organics such as biosolids. Um, as I mentioned, we work extensively together, uh, HydroTerra and ourselves, where we do the sort of field data collection and monitoring system side of things, and they do the consultancy. Uh, just before we get started, we love having questions, and certainly we've had a lot of uh, questions being asked over the last few webinars, which is fantastic. If you want to raise a question, you use the Q&A button at the top of your screen, and you uh, type that in, and uh, at the end of this webinar, I will read out those questions, and Matt and myself will endeavour to answer them. When we run out of time, we will... Uh, send you emails uh, responding to your question if we don't get time to get to it today. Um, why is HydroTerra doing these webinars? Well, we like to generate awareness and share knowledge, uh, particularly in the areas of monitoring methodologies and technologies, but also really about how they can be applied to improve operational efficiency and environmental outcomes. Uh, we see an important role of a business like HydroTerra to train the broader market in technologies that are emerging. And uh, we think it's really important that we also gain an understanding of industry needs from these. And that's where Q&A is so important. So today, you've got myself, Managing Director of HydroTerra, who's going to uh, present towards the end of this presentation and introduce Matt. Matt's going to talk, tell us a bit about what wastewater is, uh, what methods there are by which wastewater can be used, and key considerations for wastewater management. Finally, we're going to talk about monitoring and reporting obligations, and then I'm going to talk to a case study where we've worked together. So I'm gonna pass control over to Matt now and let him take us forward. Thanks very much, Matt. Great, thanks, Richard. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in on the webinar. I hope you're all well, um, particularly those of us that are in Victoria and New South Wales and have been dealing with the storm that's come through and other states as well. I hope you're all safe and surviving that okay. Uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, it's great to be here talking about uh, wastewater or recycled water. As Richard said, uh, I've spent the best deal of 20 odd years uh, in and around uh, recycled water and looking for sustainable ways to make sure we can utilize it as best as we can. Uh, and I'll share with you today some of my thoughts and looking forward to any questions that you've got. And we can pick through those towards the back end uh, of the webinar. So I thought we might start off with just with some definitions to set the scene. Um, for those that are close to the industry, you'll know that there can be a lot of discussion about whether it's wastewater or whether it's recycled water. Uh, at the end of the day, 
I don't think it really matters too much and you're free to call it whatever you like. Uh, from my point of view, I prefer recycled water as the term. Uh, and the reason for that is I think it gives a nice feel for the resource that it is and the value that we can get from it. Uh, that it is a really good water source out there that we need to make the most out of. And I like the idea that recycled water is something we're putting back into our systems and getting the most out of. Uh, that third dot point you can see on the screen there, uh, it's actually a definition that I've taken from the new EPA uh, recycled water guidelines that have been released. This is Victorian EPA that have been released in the last few months, uh, known as publication 1910 or publication 1910. And I think it sums up really quite neatly uh, what I'm going to be talking about today and referring to, which is water that's been derived from sewage systems or industry processes and treated to a standard that is appropriate and fit for its intended use. There's a couple of really important terms in there, I think, set the scene for our discussion this afternoon. Uh, so it picks up that we're talking about recycled water uh, from sewage systems. So municipal treatment plants and even trade waste treatment plants where they feed in. Um, but the industry is a really important part of our wastewater industry as well. So dairy processing wastewater, abattoirs, um, even some sale yards, a whole range of things. There's lots of industry out there that are producing a form of recycled water, which they then need to find a management option for. Um, so it's not just our larger municipal treatment plants that are dealing with some big volumes in our towns and cities. There's lots of other forms of recycled water out there, which is just as important uh, and that we're consistently looking for really great solutions for. Uh, the last stop point is an important one that we're not talking about on farm effluent today. So we're not talking about dairy effluent or piggery effluent. Um, whilst there are lots of similarities, so when we come to managing those sources of water, we're still worried about nutrients and salts and acidity and pH and potential impacts on the environment uh, and volumetric loadings, et cetera. Um, but it is an important distinction that we're not dealing with farm effluent today. We are talking about uh, industrial recycled water and then also sewage from the municipal treatment plants. Why is that important? Uh, there can be a lot of confusion at times between the on-farm effluents and the other wastewater or recycled water sources. Uh, and they've got different makeups, particularly from a microbiological point of view, which can really impact on what their end uses look like. Um, and whilst those similarities are there, they're better dealt with separately. Okay, for some reason, I can't seem to go onto the next slide, Richard. All right. Well, uh, I tell you, you what, I'll, I'll try to control from here. Let's see how we go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about recycled water management options and the ways that we have available to us to manage this resource. Uh, increasingly, recycled water is being seen as a valuable resource with lots of potential uses. Uh, and it's clearly that we've seen over the last 20 years throughout the industry that our advancements in the number of recycled water schemes uh, have been increasing year on year uh, and becoming a lot more sophisticated. And that's a fantastic thing. Uh, we know that particularly in Australia, we're a pretty dry place. Our water is a really precious resource and we've got to be making sure we're being as efficient with it as we possibly can, but that also means that we're using our alternative water sources to their fullest potential. Uh, and there's a great range of uses for recycled water. Uh, it's not currently in vogue in Australia, but we do know other parts of the world um, that are, have got very clear direct and indirect potable reuse schemes, uh, which is a really great thing if you're an advocate for that, of which I am. Um, We've seen that a lot of places that have been struggling with dry conditions and drought conditions uh, have set up these indirect and direct potable reuse schemes where we've got confidence in the technology and our treatment standards that we can treat our recycled water sources to the suitable standard and use them for drinking water. Um, 
so that's something that's happening. There's a lot of energy for that all around the place. Um, and who knows what the future of that will be for in Australia. Hopefully, as I said, from my opinion, we move in that direction. Um, a large part of what we do with our recycled water sources is irrigation. We've got a range of irrigation schemes that operate all across different parts of Australia. Um, so broadacre irrigation, so dairy and some forms of cropping and beef and sheep grazing, um, lots of large schemes where we're irrigating either recycled water direct uh, to pastures and crops, uh, or we're mixing it or shanding it with other sources of irrigation water and using it really productively to, to drive agriculture and get great outcomes. Uh, similarly, in a range of horticultural settings, um, depending on the quality of the recycled water, uh, there's lots of different things we can do. Um, so when we talk about class A, so the highest standard of recycled water that we've got, we can use that on really fresh varieties uh, of horticulture um, through to uh, orchards and vineyards and a whole range of things. Uh, lots of you would also be familiar with recycled water use for sporting grounds and golf courses. Um, golf courses have been adopting recycled water for irrigation for a number of years and doing it really well uh, and getting really good outcomes. And similarly, lots of our footy ovals, um, soccer ovals, et cetera, soccer pitches are being used, are using recycled water uh, to make sure they've got the best turf conditions possible um, for that facility and drive really great uh, sporting facilities. And then also into our public open spaces, uh, our parks and gardens and that type of thing, uh, particularly with the millennium drought that took hold across lots of uh, Eastern Australia uh, during the early 2000s. We saw lots of advancements in recycled water schemes and recy recycled water being piped back into a lot of places and used to, to green areas of the community, which when things are dry and there's not much rain around and the droughts at its worst, those green areas can offer a real salvation area for communities to get to and uh, be outside in uh, more comfortable conditions than just dry parklands. Um, we also saw during the drought, uh, that millennium drought and other times, recycled water being used for lakes and wetlands, um, which again really adds to the amenity of our towns uh, and provides really great focal points um, and it's a good use for that water depending on what the, the active uses on the waterway are. We know that recycled water is being used back through industry. Um, so cooling towers, uh, a whole range of things, some washdowns, depending on what the quality of the water is like. It gets used for dust suppression and road making. Um, in certain areas, there's an ocean outfall that occurs with recycled water. Um, but the one that I thought might be worth spending a little bit of time on, which is getting into prominence a lot more um, is this river, creek and stream discharge. We've seen over the years that some recycled water treatment plants have had what we call a license discharge where they've been able to discharge the treated recycled water into the stream or creek or river, depending on the size of it. Uh, but increasingly what we're seeing is that uh, it's not really a discharge, it's actually being used to benefit uh, the flows in that waterway. Uh, a lot of our creeks and streams and rivers, one of the single greatest things that's impacting them uh, is lack of flow. Um, so farm dams dotted across the catchment, climate change, uh, more abstraction of water for our uh, growing urban populations means that a lot of our waterways have reduced in flow. And so there's a great opportunity where we can get recycled water into the right quality uh, to be able to release it into these waterways and drive some really fantastic benefits um, by supporting the aquatic environment and driving a, a better ecosystem. Uh, so that's been happening for quite a while. There was a, a scheme that we were involved with uh, working with Golden Valley Water. Uh, so in central to northern Victoria, uh, putting recycled water back into the Kilmore Creek. So treated uh, sewage from uh, the Kilmore wastewater treatment plant being treated to a really high standard and being put back into the creek at specific times throughout the year to drive environmental flows, uh, to improve uh, what that waterway was like uh, and to get much better outcomes. One of the interesting things with that project was that uh, we've worked with the local catchment management authority and the landholders 
to offset any of the nutrients that were going to be released to the waterway. So there was a whole lot of work done with farmers in the region uh, to increase riparian vegetation, uh, to fence stock out of the waterways um, and to improve some other practices that were impacting on the creek. So that was effectively neutralising and providing better creek outcomes and neutralising uh, the nutrients that were being released into the waterway and therefore driving a, an overall much better environmental outcome. So I think with a drying climate, we're going to look to see a lot more opportunities for that in the future, as well as those traditional uses of recycled water around irrigation and amenity lakes and some of the industrial reuse that we're seeing. Uh, next slide, thanks Richard. I thought it'd be worthwhile if we spend a bit of time looking at the different components of what goes into recycled water management. Um, and in the first case, when you look at this slide, it might be a bit overwhelming and daunting to see uh, the number of different uh, components that we need to think our way through. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's relatively straightforward um, and it's common sense uh, that we're dealing with. Um, and if we've got some good data to support us along the way, then we can make some really good decisions and make it work. Uh, but ultimately, we're thinking about water quality uh, how much water we're looking after, so the volume, what our receiving environment looks like. Uh, and as part of that receiving environment, uh, the community where it exists and the potential impacts on health. How are we going to set up a good scheme from a monitoring and reporting point of view to make sure we know what's going on, but also from a continuous improvement point of view that we can drive really good outcomes and make sure that we're managing the recycled water the best way that we can. Uh, our people, we can never forget our people. They're integral to us and they're integral to our really well-developed recycled water management schemes. So have our people got the right skills? What sort of training do we need to provide? Uh, and from a professional point of view, uh, hopefully those people on the webinar, and it's certainly true for Richard and I, that we've been able to drive a really great career uh, out of this industry. Uh, and there's lots of opportunity for that into the future. So providing a really strong uh, pathway for people to get involved in the industry and have a really fulfilled work life and provide really great outcomes from an environmental management point of view and a resource management point of view. Um, the economic viability of our schemes is also critically important. Uh, they can be costly at times. Um, sometimes for irrigation schemes, we're piping the water uh, some distance to get it to the farmland or to access the amount of farmland that we need to make the scheme work. So it's really important that if we're gonna spend a lot of money on capital uh, and have some considerable operating costs, uh, that the end use that we're supplying the recycled water to is economically viable, and they're gonna be able to use the recycled water and thrive over the next 10, 20 beyond years. Uh, and that's what that last box there is talking about, the win-win outcomes. Ultimately, we want to be using recycled water uh, for its highest potential value and to make sure that everyone, so that's the producer of the recycled water, the end user of the recycled water and the community drive really great outcomes. The water quality will really dictate what we can do. Um, and we generally talk about different classes of recycled water, um, particularly in Victoria, but other states are similar. Uh, so class A uh, being our highest standard, which can be used for uncontrolled public access. So if we're going into a park uh, where the you know, community have got access to that park all the time, that's a class A standard. Um, also to some of those fresh varieties of uh, fruit and vegetables. Um, there's some where it's still not appropriate, but lots where it is. Uh, the second class is class B, uh, where it can be used for sporting sites, Dominantly, um, it also has some advantages for dairy uh, farms, particularly where we've got lactating animals. Uh, and then class C is our last class of recycled water. Up until recently, uh, class D was the other source of recycled water we had available to us. Um, but it's now just classes A, B and C in Victoria with the release of the new guidelines, publications 1910 and 1911, uh, which have been uh, with us for a couple of months. Um, so the class of the recycled water is really driven by the microbiological quality 
Uh, we use E. coli uh, as the reference organism there, but also look at viruses and protozoas by the time we get into looking at class A recycled water. Uh, so that class can dictate how the recycled water can be used, but I can't stress the importance of also understanding the other parameters of your recycled water. So what's the salinity gonna be like? What are the nutrients like? Uh, are there any toxicants in terms of heavy metals, emerging contaminants, pH, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so having a really great understanding of what your recycled water quality looks like, having some good monitoring data to support that. Uh, and then identifying through the guidelines that are available where the recycled water can and can't be used is a really important first step but then thinking about your volume, thinking about the receiving environment. So what impact am I potentially gonna have on soils? How am I gonna look after the beneficial uses of surface waters and groundwater or the marine environment? Uh, making sure I'm not impacting on flora and fauna or cultural heritage. So our indigenous heritage, but also some parts of European heritage as well, but certainly cultural heritage is an enormous part of the planning that goes into recycled water schemes these days. And that's been a really great uh, increase in focus over uh, the last years. Um, so there's a range of things that need to be thought about, um, but certainly understanding the data, having good information that enables you to make good decisions can be really important. Can we roll to the next slide, Richard? Sure. Uh, there's a few things that I've learned over the last 20 years of recycled water management, um, which I want to impress on you now. Um, we don't have long enough today to talk in enough detail about all the components, but I think uh, if you take these practices on board, uh, you're going to maximise the possibility of having a really fantastic recycled water scheme. The first one is that successful schemes aren't set and forget. And what I mean by that is that they take ongoing work and they take consistent resourcing to make them work. Uh, a key part of that is communication, really strong communication between whoever's producing the recycled water and your end user. Uh, sometimes it's the same organisation. Uh, sometimes the end user could be a third party. But having really great communication, which talks about the quality of water that's consistently being developed, how much water is available, what it's being used for, is it being used in accordance with the management plan, uh, it's an ongoing job and sometimes what we see is where schemes start to fall over uh, is because the resourcing just simply isn't there to make it work uh, and it's an old adage uh, little things done consistently over a long period of time um, can make things work a whole lot better rather than putting something in place forgetting about it and coming back a lot later down the track only to realize there's a whole lot of problems that have occurred uh, the second one is there's no substitute for good data. I can't express this highly enough either. Know your recycled water inside out. We were touching on it on the previous slide. Understand your microbiological quality, understand the salinity, understand the nutrients, understand the impact it might have in your receiving environment and how you're going to manage it and the mitigation practice you've got available to you. Uh, but you need to be undertaking monitoring of recycled water quality, I would say monthly. Uh, throughout the year, particularly during the irrigation season, if it's an irrigation system that you've got set up. But looking for those changes over time, is it consistent? Is it fluctuating? Understanding the reasons why it may be fluctuating and the impact it's going to have, uh, that's really critical. Uh, planning for your scheme is really important, uh, but planning for the wet year, I think is the most important thing that you can do. Uh, in dry years, particularly for operating irrigation schemes, dry years can be annoying because we can run out of recycled water during the season. Uh, and if you're supplying recycled water to a commercial farmer, for example, under contract, and they run out of water partway through the irrigation season, they're not gonna to be too impressed. But from a compliance point of view, uh, if you've emptied your lagoon prior to the winter storage period, then you're gonna be in a much better situation. But the wet years is where we really start to test the, the friendship and where uh, our struggles can come along. So you need to have a really good plan that can clearly show how you're gonna manage your recycled water when we've got uh, a little bigger volumes that we're trying to manage. 
Recycled water is often described as a really sustainable, stable source of water. And whilst that's true, it does fluctuate quite considerably uh, with the environment and with the climate, the same way a lot of our water sources do. So during a drought, we're going to have a lot less when we wish we had more. And during the wet years, we're going to have heaps of it to manage when we wish we didn't have it. But it is those wet years that you need to have a plan for. Uh, so often we do that through water balance modelling, uh, which we'll touch on in a bit more detail in a minute, but we make sure that we've got enough infrastructure. So enough storage and enough end use to manage how much water we're going to generate in a wet year. Uh, it's a really critical part of uh, putting together a good scheme and making sure you're planned for all sorts of conditions that could come towards you. Uh, reconcile your data again. Um, we see a lot of systems where data is being collected and it's being recorded in a spreadsheet or put into a spreadsheet and not a great deal of thought has been given to what that information means. Uh, so one, I would go back and make sure that the data makes sense. So are the results I'm getting, do they pass the gut test or is there something in there that gives me an inkling that either the data might not be recorded well, maybe there's a flow meter that's out, Maybe we've got a leak somewhere. Um, maybe we're recording from a different area where we thought we shouldn't have been or we should have been. Or maybe we've got some data that says to me our treatment process isn't working well. Or something new has been introduced which has changed how much water we've got or what our quality looks like. Um, not just trusting data blindly and putting it into spreadsheets uh, is really important. Having a critical eye and looking through that data and understanding why you're getting the numbers that you are and why it may be fluctuating is really important because it'll help you to keep track of how well your scheme's operating uh, and whether you're maintaining your compliance or not. It'll give you a much better understanding of your system. So you'll be much more in tune with how things will ebb and flow and what you might expect to see when little changes are made. Um, it'll just keep you in good contact with everything that's going on. So reconcile your data. Please, um, if you take one thing out of this, uh, I hope that's it. Really make sure you understand what your data is saying and what it's all about. Um, and the last point there is all good schemes are underpinned by a good water balance, in my opinion. So Richard, if we roll over to the next slide, uh, I, I really think this is critical for any recycled water irrigation scheme that you understand what your inflows or what your volumes throughout the year are going to look like. Uh, what their seasonal variation is and how you're going to make them work. Uh, there's a few graphs on here and I'll just quickly talk our way through them. Uh, the graph in the bottom left-hand corner is what we call a sawtooth graph, but that's modelling how a winter storage is expected to fill and empty uh, over a 20-year period. Uh, in this example, our criteria is that we've provided enough infrastructure to manage the recycled water in a 90th percentile wet year. So you can see from that graph, there's 20 years of data. The lagoon would spill in two of the 20 years. So there's your 90th percentile containment. Uh, what we're seeing here is that the storage is consistently filling and emptying apart from those few wet years, which is exactly what we want to see in our recycled water schemes. That means we've got a good balance between winter storage and irrigation uh, and that we're looking after our compliance quite well. The graph in the top right hand corner uh, is a curve that we often produce, which looks at the different combinations of storage and irrigation area you can have to manage a certain volume of water. So as that curve shows, you can have a really large area, a really large storage volume and a really small irrigation area, or a really large irrigation area and a really small volume and still achieve 90th percentile containment, which is what this curve is looking at doing or 50th percentile containment or 75th percentile containment, whatever your measure may be. But the best uh, combination is where that curve breaks and starts to flatten out. So in that example, it's gonna be somewhere around about 20 to 25 hectares uh, and about 80 to 100 megalitres. That's where you're gonna drive the best results from your scheme, but it makes sure that you've got enough infrastructure in place to cater for that wet year, which I was touching on previously. The graph in the bottom right hand corner, those, those first two graphs that I spoke about, that's what we would call strategic water balance modeling. So making sure that I've got enough infrastructure set up 
to cater for the volume of recycled water that I'm going to be producing. The graph in the bottom right-hand corner is what we'd call an operational winter uh, water balance, where it's looking at how much recycled water we've got in storage uh, throughout the season, and then what might happen under various climatic conditions. So the blue line, which is giving uh, the highest values, uh, that's what would happen in a wet year, so greater than, greater than a 90th percentile wet year. Uh, the second line is an average year through to a dry year, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great way of predicting what shape you're in. Uh, is my storage going to overflow? Uh, am I going to have to try and increase how much reuse I've got and what I can do with my water? Again, a really good thing to have throughout the year. Next one. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Richard, next slide, if we can, please. Sorry, guys, Richard probably drop off. We are going to share the screen again. Sorry, Matt, and you can uh, continue. No worries. Thank you. Sure. I've got it here if you'd like me to share it, but I'll let you. Yep, just a moment. Yeah, great, great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so apologies, everyone who are online watching the webinar, um, but that's the wonders of what happens when you're doing these things. Uh, so monitoring and reporting, again, it's really critical um, that we have good systems set up from a monitoring and reporting point of view. It helps us keep check as to how our schemes are performing. Uh, are we meeting our compliance, uh, which is a really important part. So Typically, we'll have a management, a management program set up and, or an environmental management plan in place, which is going to detail the monitoring we're going to do to make sure that we're looking after the scheme uh, and having a really positive impact and not having a detrimental or a negative impact on the environment or human health or animal health. Um, what your monitoring looks like will be driven by the individual scheme needs um, and should be underpinned by a really good risk assessment which will help show where you've got risks, the, mit the mitigation practices you might need to put in place, uh, and then the monitoring you're going to undertake to show that you're either mitigating your risks successfully or whether you need to make a change in your scheme. Um, monitoring, yeah, that's uh, typically around volume and quality and soil chemistry, and nutrient balances, uh, groundwater, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you need to make sure your monitoring is set up is efficient, it's repeatable, uh, it's accurate uh, and underpinned by good science and really skilled technicians, we find it's a good way to go. If you're undertaking the monitoring in-house, yeah, please make sure that you've got people who have got uh, a good understanding of the monitoring they're undertaking, the science that sits behind it and what they need to do to drive really good results because the monitoring data that we collect is critically important to our schemes. It's, it's the one thing that we've got that the schemes get judged by, and it's the, the single piece of information or the single pieces of information that we can use uh, to improve the schemes and what they're like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're just gonna change gears a little bit now and talk about the new Victorian Environmental Protection Act, which is about to come into vogue uh, on the 1st of July this year. Um, parts of it are already in place. Um, and I thought I might just touch on some of the changes uh, just to give people an introduction if you haven't already caught up with it. Uh, the three terms that you see on your screen, or well, there's four terms really, the preventative approach, the general environmental duties, the state of knowledge and reasonably practicable. We're going to become very familiar with those if we're not already. So the general environmental duty, uh, that's the overarching uh, concept that sits behind uh, the new Victorian EP Act. Uh, I'll leave you to read the definition. Uh, the state of knowledge is a really interesting one. Um, so what should be known or reasonably known about the risks of harm to human health and the environment 
and the means of eliminating these or otherwise reducing those risks. Uh, so our state of knowledge is going to be really important. It's what we're going to be assessed against and it's going to be up to everyone who's managing recycled water to make sure their state of knowledge is up to date and they know what they should be doing to managing their schemes. And to the extent reasonably practicable means putting in controls that are proportionate to the risk. So having good risk assessments in place, understanding what our risks are and how we're going to mitigate them uh, is going to be an important part of the new EP Act. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just an overview uh, of how the new EP Act is going to come together, but we might roll to the next slide in the interest of time. Uh, there's going to be a new set of what's called permissions. So there'll be licenses, there'll be permits, and there'll be registrations. A lot of the things that we do with recycled water, particularly from an irrigation point of view, will be covered by permits. Uh, and that term we spoke about before being the state of knowledge, the new guidelines that have been released uh, in Victoria, so publication 1910, uh, that replaces the old publication that some of you may be familiar with, which was publication 464.2. That's the overarching document in Victoria for recycled water management. And beneath that will be two technical publications which can be used to help drive really good schemes. So publication 1911 and publication 168. Uh, 168 is specific to uh, wastewater or recycled water irrigation. So publication 1910 and 1911, they were released in the last couple of months. Uh, we, being RMCG, are fortunate enough that we're currently working on a rewrite of publication 168 with EPA. Uh, and we hope that that's going to be released uh, towards the latter end of this year. Uh, but they will provide a range of information that will help inform people's state of knowledge and what they need to be aware of when they're managing recycled water. Uh, next slide. Now, this last slide really just shows, again, how they all come together. Um, but there is a very formal link to the Australian Guidelines for Water Recycling. Uh, so those new publications, 1910, 1911, and the revised version of 168 that we're working on, uh, they all fall under the broader banner of the Australian Guidelines for Water Recycling, uh, which have been a great set of guidelines. They've been out for a, quite a while now, um, but we're seeing some really good uh, coordination between the states where they're all referring to an overarching set of documents. The output of all this work is producing a management plan that can be in place to manage your recycled water. In the past, they've been called environment improvement plans, but uh, they're going to be called health and environmental management plans now. So we're going from EIPs to HEMPs in Victoria, and they'll essentially be the output of where people are articulating what their systems are going to look like, the risk assessments that they've worked through, uh, the mitigation practices they're going to have in place and how they're going to drive really good, sustainable recycled water use. Uh, the next slide. Uh, if Richard's on the line, I'm going to hand over to you, Richard, to pick up this case study. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. That's good news. Sorry, my Zoom uh, cut out earlier, everybody. Um, so look, I just thought we'd share one case study in particular. A bit of an emphasis I wanted to put on this was raising awareness on what can be done automatically. And uh, certainly in the context of what Matt was saying about state of knowledge, um, there's quite a lot of technology that's emerging or established that can be used to uh, better manage wastewater or certainly optimise it. So what was this project about? You'll see on the right-hand side there, there's a large lagoon. That lagoon was coming from a milk powder factory. When you create milk powder, you take a lot of uh, fluid out of it, obviously, out of the milk, and that comes in as a, and, and forms an effluent, which is monitored. It's monitored as part of the process and at the discharge points to these ponds. It's also monitored in real time in those ponds. Now, typically that sort of monitoring happens as part of the production facility. So 
the data often is in the format of a SCADA system, which is linked to various control devices and that sort of thing. So often that data is not readily available to people managing the environment, certainly either for, from a compliance point of view or uh, for managing it in terms of optimising it. So often one of the first challenges is just to get all the information and data that you need into one place so you can start doing those comparisons of data and look at how you can use that data to optimise application. Obviously, if you're going to use that for something like optimising irrigation, you need that data in a really timely way. And so typically you need to set it up on a telemetry type arrangement. So that water that I pointed out in that lagoon needs to find a home. And, uh, you know, these factories keep running all year round, regardless of what the environment's really doing. So you need to be getting rid of that water in a timely way to meet those requirements that Matt referred to in terms of not having too much water in the pond. So there's a number of inputs you need and a number of things you need to know about that and quite a bit of infrastructure you need to actually get rid of that. So the picture on the left shows how this particular facility managed those aspects. So that sketch of the looks like slices of a pie is actually a, uh, a pivot irrigator's um, sort of settings for how it, it, it irrigates and it, it, uh, it rotates around and it's applying water out onto, in this case, pasture, which was used for grazing. Um, that pasture uh, and, and the amount that you get off was monitored. So they actually know the yield that's coming off there. And they're trying to balance optimising that pasture growth with their environmental compliance obligations. So what are those environmental compliance obligations? Well, in this instance, there's, there's quite a few. So there's a relatively shallow water table. So part of their EIP or uh, soon to be changed name uh, plan um, is about protecting groundwater quality. So you need to be thinking about not only the quality of the water you're putting on, but the amount and trying to get a balance there between the transpiration rate of the grass or the pastures versus the infiltration capacity of your soil and the application rate of your irrigation system. Secondly, there were surface water considerations. So there are streams that run adjacent to those irrigation paddocks. And one risk is you put too much water on, you create overland flow and those impacted waters can potentially discharge off site. Now, obviously that varies completely with antecedent moisture conditions. So if the paddock's already pretty wet, then you need to throttle back your application rate or maybe in some circumstances turn it off altogether because uh, otherwise you're creating a surface runoff and potentially exceeding your compliance requirements. So these sorts of projects, they really do need a collaborative approach between the farmer who's looking after the pasture, your consultant who's looking after environmental compliance, and the site operator of the facility who's producing the effluent and managing and controlling that. So on this particular project, how to balance all these things? Well, we had to set up a, uh, a set of systems to ingest data in a timely way. And as Matt mentioned, you know, uh, often the data is in spreadsheets and things, so it does involve changing processes for data collection. Um, it involved customising how to view that data. So we had data inputs coming from the irrigation setup. We had data inputs coming from the environmental compliance monitoring. So things like depth to groundwater and any water quality monitoring results from there. And we needed the time series data coming from the SCADA system that was uh, being used 
in the operating facility. So all that data needed to come together. But most importantly, how to, how to automate a water balance, right? Um, heard the importance of water balance. Well, in particular, how to automate the unsaturated zone of your pasture paddocks, right? Because that's really what's driving compliance here. If you can balance your application rates with your soil moisture content and prevent offsite either discharge to groundwater or surface water runoff, that's the definition of success. And to do that, you need real-time data on your soil moisture. And uh, in this particular site, we used capacitance probes that measured soil moisture at 10 centimetre increments down below the soil. And they had a controller, an automated controller, which changed the irrigation rates that came from the pivot irrigators. So a fair bit of automation there. So that, that's an example of a, of a project. The, what else is coming in the way of technology that's relevant to this? There's a system that was developed in Western Australia by a company that we have a relationship with called Swan Systems. And they can automate your weather forecasting data as well as your soil moisture data coming from capacitance probes. And they can do a real time projection of the application rates that you can put on, taking into account weather forecast data. Obviously, that's really valuable if you're trying to manage the amount of effluent sitting in that pond. If you know seven days out that there's going to be a lot of rain, then you want to optimise putting that out before the rain comes, rather than having a pond that's going to be overflowing during those storms. So Swan Systems is certainly something I'd suggest you have a look at. Uh, we have a link on our website to that, but it's a really fantastic piece of technology. Uh, the last bit of technology news is uh, Matt's mentioned the importance of microbial monitoring, and there's some really uh, cool technology emerging around both handheld devices to measure things like E. coli in the field using nanotechnology, um, which is something that we're looking to bring to Australia. So it's a little portable device like a photometer, and uh, that will give you a reading of E. coli readings and other bacterial readings. The bit of nanotechnology allows it to be sort of specific for certain bacteria types, which is very clever. At the other end of the spectrum, there are real-time continuous monitors now available for measuring things like E. coli. They're quite expensive systems and quite large. They need um, mains power supply and that sort of thing, but they do exist. And uh, there's a company out of the Netherlands called Microlan that set up these continuous monitoring systems uh, who we're also forming a relationship with. So be aware, you can measure things like E. coli in the field using portable devices, and you can measure them continuously. Um, I think that will cover everything I wanted to talk about. I think we should leave a few minutes for questions. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I'm not sure if I can view the Q&A. Oh, yes, I might be able to today. All right, so there's no open questions at the moment. I'd encourage you to put some questions in. In the interim, I will ask a couple of questions of Matt. Um, so Matt, firstly, I suppose, you know, we are in a pandemic and we have uh, issues with viruses and that sort of thing in our wastewater streams. You hear about them monitoring that. But how effective are our treatment systems at um, treating those sorts of viruses before, you know, for example, we put them out on horticultural crops? You've got a position on that? Uh, absolutely. I think there's been a lot of work done, Richard, to, to make sure that we've we specify the treatment processes that are need, needed for the different types of end uses. So if we're going to uh, a fresh crop, um, which is gonna you know, not undergo 
uh, any processing or cooking or anything like that, then we need to make sure the quality of water is suitable for that type of end use. And there's been loads of work done uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years to make sure that our, our treatment standards are really top notch and they can produce the quality of water we need um, for the different types of end use. Um, and that gets tested really rigorously. There's really good controls in place, you know, critical control points and quality assurance management plans, et cetera, which are really quite stringent to make sure that whoever's producing that water, uh, they're doing it to the standard that's required and then it's suitable for the end use. And those end uses are really well documented throughout all the guidance that we've got available be it the Australian guidelines or the individual state guidelines. Um, so I think we can take a lot of confidence that our, our water quality experts and our scientists who are working on that side of things have been thinking about it hard for a long time and we've got really well-established practices in place. Okay, well, that, that gives me uh, some comfort, Matt. <laughs> Glad to hear we're not <laughs> pumping viruses straight out on our salad. Yeah. Um, Nigel McGuckian has a question. <laughs> Is there a need for a water quality standard between A and B, particularly for use as environmental flows? Uh, yeah, so g'day, Nigel. Um, for environmental flows, I think it's all about um, what the beneficial use of that waterway is um, and its environmental condition. So uh, if we know that that waterway is going to be used for a primary contact recreation, for example, for swimming, uh, we're going to have a higher treatment standard that's needed uh, versus if it's not used for swimming or drinking water or whatever it may be. Um, we don't always need Class A recycled water for environmental flows. So I think my approach would be that we use the science and our risk assessments to help drive what the answer should be that we articulate that catchment, uh, what the beneficial uses are, how it's being used, and how we're gonna go about making sure that we're looking after those beneficial uses and uh, mitigating any of the risks that we identify. Um, so is there something specific between class A and class B? Um, there probably won't be, I'm not sure there needs to be. I think we can get about it through that risk assessment process. <laughs> I might add to that question, Matt. So things like this um, emerging technology around continuous microbial monitoring, do you think mm. that's actually valuable in the context of working out uh, whether you can discharge that water for environmental flows and that sort of thing? Or would that I, be... I, I think if it helps provide confidence to whoever's involved, be that the people running the scheme or the community, then that's a really good thing, Richard. So if we've got systems in place that are operating the way they should be, and we can see from the data that's being recorded that they're consistently meeting the targets that we need to mitigate any risks, then yeah, I'm all for it. I think there's, um, there's an opportunity to do it. Um, you've got to balance the cost of it, I suppose. That's the one thing that you've got to think about, but um, you're probably a bit closer to me. So I'm interested in your thoughts as well, but it would seem like there's good potential for it. Um, well, I think there's probably real benefits in those spot measurement devices because mm. they'll be pretty low cost and produce a reading in sort of less than half an hour. So uh, you can do spot checks. In terms of real-time monitoring, um, I'm really not sure, right? So it's certainly if it's real-time monitoring, you can... Um, know what the trends are in your you know your microbial levels and that mm. sort of thing and it would probably be a good way of retrospectively checking if you had an exceedance or set an alarm on that uh, so perhaps if it's linked with an automatic shutoff and you've got a um, a criteria for a particular concentration or a coli reading that could be a real benefit um, so yes yeah, probably benefits but it would be interesting to map it out versus what you do yeah, um, I, think, I think the caution too is we know that they're going to jump around a bit, um, the treatment plants, So, um, which is often why we're interested in median results from a water quality point of view, um, knowing what the 75th or the 90th max might look like as well. But So we would need to make sure we take a balanced approach to it rather than just 
getting scared by a limit which may jump at any one time, um, but then may flatten out over you know the rest of the day or something like that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, got another question here from Adam Boozer, Buzzer. Um, with respect to the case study, what's the approximate cost of that package? You know, automated weather station, soil moisture, telemetry, irrigation, decision support. Look, there's a few elements to that. It's not easy to provide you with a cost estimate straight off the bat, but I would say that the first step is we do a monitoring system design. Uh, typically, the cost for us to do something like that sort of design sits between about five and ten thousand dollars, and that produces, you know, monitoring design and a specification which includes recommendations on equipment and that sort of thing. In the particular case study, there was a lot of uh, pre-existing infrastructure, for example, water quality sons in those lagoons. They had a weather station on site. Uh, so the infrastructure that we were adding there was really the real-time soil moisture sensors. We did in, end up putting another weather station in because the weather station on site was a bit weary. Um, and then to integrate it back into data stream is pretty low cost. If you want to add something like SWAN systems to it, there's another costing structure around that, and that's typically about $6,000 per year to have that SWAN systems facility on top of it. Um, the amount they charge depends a bit on the number of pivot irrigators that you have on site, for example. Um, So there's another question, but it's sitting in the chats. Uh, I will go to the chat session. Um, oh, trying to. In regards to technologies available, this is from Sebastian Quintana. Uh, in regards to technologies available, would there be an interest in laser flow meter instruments to qualify flows on? shallow water beds or where surface conditions are a bit harsh, given the ability of these devices to measure true velocity, whoops, true velocity under the surface of the water. I'm new to the industry, so just a silly question. No such thing as a silly question, Sebastian. So uh, Matt, what's your view on that one? Well, it sounds like a Hydra Terra answer to me, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Well, it's a bit of a combination, right? So um, there's, there's several ways to measure velocity. Um, one of the challenges of measuring flow velocity uh, comes down to when you're dealing with um, conditions where you have no flow at all, for example, and then you have substantial flow. So other technologies that are used for, for example, open channel flow or things like Doppler sensors, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of the time you have flow meters coming into your irrigators, right? So in the case of the case study, that um, flow data was critical, but that was in pipe flow. So you normally use um, something like a mag flow on those or an impeller. And if you've got a low budget, and that provides you with real-time flow data. In terms of compliance on, um, uh, I mean, Matt, I'm not actually sure if you ever sort of flood irrigate with wastewater. Uh, so. Yeah, no, definitely. There's um, there's really good examples on the right soil types. Um, and this is what you always need to think about when you're picking your way through different irrigation systems. Um, but on the right soil type, um, surface irrigation, um, can be quite efficient. So there's plenty of examples where we have recycles water's being used from a flood point of view. So uh, I think in answer to the question, there would be some opportunities uh, if that technology was the most cost-effective way to measure flow coming down the bay, for example. Um, the second part of that is then managing to make sure you're not putting too much on so you're sort of exceeding those infiltration side of things related to managing flood irrigation as well. Um, next question. 
Can you give an example of closed loop cycle for industrial waste water? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, often it's the volume, by the way. Yeah, yeah, often the volumes that are produced um, will exceed any of the internal reuse opportunities, so it it won't be completely closed loop. And the other thing we often see Baruna as well is from a risk point of view. Uh, sometimes the industry will prefer to use potable water, which has been provided by the water authority uh, for all their processes, as opposed to uh, recycled water that they've produced themselves, even though it could be of the same standard, just from a risk side of things. Um, so completely closed loop would be hard to achieve, but certainly there is industrial water that goes back into uh, for cooling purposes and that type of thing. Um, but it would be unusual that would account for the whole volume. Although there are some sites that look to um, account for uh, quite a bit themselves and make sure that they're reducing what their potable water or raw water intake may be and maximizing the value of their recycled water. All right. Um, we're just about out of time. In fact, we are out of time, but uh, which is which is pretty good because we've just run out of questions as well. So Matt, I'd just like to really thank you for sharing your knowledge today. I thought that was excellent and uh, particularly good to keep people up to speed with those new regulations and the regulations you're working on. Um, so many thanks for, for your contribution today. And if you have any queries, feel free to give us an email and we will pass those questions on uh, to Matt. Um, so many thanks, everybody, and um, thanks for coming along today. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone.